live on air. The play seminars because we talk about sure the plays are going with for so you can go many the years. They've been called literary seminars, and that, for whatever reason, that has put some people <laughs> off thinking the last thing we'll I want to do there. is get up at nine in the morning and go hear some person speak for an hour on some <laughs> academic issue, and we don't want to do that. These are meant to be conversational to get your opinion of what you saw last evening and get a conversation going. And in my 13 years of being here, it's always a surprise. I never know what you're going to say. Our guests never know what you're going to say, and that's what makes it wonderful. Um, we will have these seminars every morning uh, during preview week at 9 o'clock. Uh, we talk about the plays on the Engelstadt Theater, and at 10 o'clock, when the shows get up and running in previews, we will talk at the 10 o'clock hour about the shows that are in the Randall Theater and in the Ames Theater eventually. But this morning, we're here to talk about Henry V. You saw a little bit of history last night, and I don't just mean Shakespeare's play. I mean some of the action that went on. And uh, these directors who have lots of things to do um, are giving of their time to come and be with us for the um, nine o'clock hour. And they never promised that they'll be here for sure, but so far we're batting a thousand with David Ivers here yesterday, Brian Vaughn here this morning, and tomorrow BJ Thomas will be BJ Jones. Jones. That's okay. Yeah. Can, 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 BJ Jones, of course. Thomas, no. BJ Thomas, the singer, Thomas. right? Yeah. Yeah. B, BJ Jones will be here tomorrow to talk about Three Musketeers. But let me just introduce a man who probably doesn't need in the introduction, Brian Vaughn, who is one of two artistic directors here. He has also been in over 50 productions at the Utah Shakespeare Festival, as well as uh, working around the country, primarily at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Brian um, is, of course, the director of Henry V, a role that he created here at the festival. Henry V, until last night, had only been presented here three other times. And uh, Brian was in 2009, was Henry V. He has also played uh, Prince Hal. He has also played Hotspur. Uh, he knows the play intimately, certainly more than I know it, and I would bet more than any of you from being in it all those times. Last year, you saw him uh, as Petruchio in our highly successful Taming of the Shrew. He also, this year, will be playing Felix and Oscar opposite David Ivers, who's also playing Felix and Oscar in our production of The Odd Couple. But Brian has been with this his, these history plays for the last three seasons. He directed our production of Henry IV, Part One, Henry IV, Part Two, and now Henry V, with some of the same actors. Certainly Sam Ashdown, who many of you have seen as Prince Hal in the last two uh, Henrys, and now he's the king. And, um, and also Larry Bull, who played the King Henry IV, and now Larry is the chorus in our production. So with that long introduction, this acclaimed actor and director is our guest this morning. Thank you, Brian, for being here. Okay, so before I turn the microphone over to all of you to have your comments or questions, I wanted to ask Brian something about this play. Um, in the Henry Ford plays, we get to see a very personal side of Hal. When we see him with uh, Falstaff and we get to see, we get to know him personally. In this play, um, he's in the public almost the entire time, except for when he's with Catherine. And it is a different take on this uh, king now. We get to see the public face uh, and how he presents himself publicly. Um, how do you interpret what Shakespeare was trying to say to his audience? It's a very patriotic play. Uh, wow. Well, hello. Uh, um, yes. You know, the, the play often sometimes not necessarily gets a bad rap, but it, it sort of can be um, sort of categorized as patriotic or linguistic or uh, even sometimes creating a, a Machiavellian side to Henry as a as a warmonger or um, and all of that and 
while I do think some of that could be true, for me, the play is really about conflict and a battle of conscience of the lone individual within that conflict and how he tries to basically find his own self in the journey in this new role. And I think, you know, I, I don't necessarily think the play is pro-war or anti-war. Actually, I think it's actually more anti-war than pro-war uh, as far as what Shakespeare was, was weaving in the play. But I also think that what Shakespeare brilliantly has done is sort of also taken the theater and infused that in a story about leadership and about um, politics and reign and and um, and a shifting tide, a transition from a medieval sort of thought into a more um, contemporary democratic sense of being as far as leadership goes. He, he's also by putting it in the theater, he's also created a great parallel of Henry playing all these different roles throughout the course of the play, and then ultimately finding himself through doing that. And I look at the play as a connective tissue from part one, well, actually beginning in Richard II, as this tetralogy of plays, Richard II, Henry IV, part one, Henry IV, part two, and Henry V are really four things. While they were written at different times in Shakespeare's life, there's a connective thread with these characters that they start in one place and we end in another in history and what that has done for how through the course of this journey, which really is how a young man <laughs> takes on the burden that of the sin of the generation before him. His father is stealing the crown. He how having to inherit the crown and what that means to be a king and the weight that that means, as well as finding his own individuality within that and him trying to be all these things that really aren't him. And I think over the course of the play, what we find is an authentic sense of self in how Henry as a king. And that's one of the things I think that's actually brilliance about Henry V is that it takes theater and history and kind of fuses it into drama that it becomes quite literally how playing the role of a warrior, playing the role of a lover, playing the role of a diplomat. And then in the course of the upon the king's speech at the, at the eve of the battle, it becomes a dissection of his own sense of being about doing the right thing in a case of right and wrong and what that means going forward and he says something very very key at the end of that speech which he says the day my friends and all things stay for me and i think the me in there is that sense of self that it's not being what his father was it's not being what falstaff was it's not being what hotspur was it's tapping into that thing that makes him who he is. And the very next speech that we see from him in the course of the play is the St. Crispin's Day speech, which is probably the greatest speech ever written um, about overcoming odds and leadership and a sense of people coming together to overcome adversity. And that comes from someone who has no ego, I think. And while the mission could be viewed as egocentric, it comes from a place of authenticity and honesty and truth that is unlike any of the other sort of rousing speeches that you might find in some of these other plays, because it, come, it becomes about not him, it becomes about those around him. And, and I think that that's just something really, really beautiful and poetic actually. Um, you know, this play was actually written in 1599, uh, which was actually a really <laughs> prolific year for William Shakespeare. He wrote uh, Twelfth Night, um, Much Ado About Nothing, Julius Caesar, Henry V, As You Like It, and Hamlet, all at this time. And those plays, all of them, revolve also around these isolated people who begin to reflect about their self. 
in the midst of all of this stuff. Brutus, um, Viola, Benedict, Beatrice, and different forms of thematic issues. And of course, Hamlet, who will be the greatest philosopher of that issue of finding living in the now, as he says in Hamlet. Uh, if it be not now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Since no man of all he leaves knows what is to leave the times, let be. And that sense of like not living in the future, not living in the past, but living in the present sense of being. And I think Shakespeare's tapping into that in all of these plays. And in this play, he taps into that in a world that's about conflict and military rule and um, and the isolated king within that, the ruler. And all of the history plays sort of deal with a lot of that issue, the burden of the king. We see it in Henry IV where he comes out and he's like, I can't sleep and he's thinking and he's, you know, we see that in our leaders today. You look at, you know, Obama now and how great or Clinton or Bush, all these, you know, they go from these young sort of vital strapping presidents and by the end of it, it's like they've aged. It's only been eight years, some of them, you know. Um, and I think that burden is reflected poetically in this play about what it means to find yourself within the stakes that are larger than all of us. And he uses this landscape, this platform, which is the Battle of Agincourt, which is probably the greatest military victory in history, and says, what is it like for the person who is in the middle of that? To know that everywhere you go, you are back down, you're moving forward, and you're pushed back, and moving forward, and you're pushed back, and you're pushed back, and you're pushed back, and here you are in the morning, you're completely outnumbered, and the fate of the history of the people that went before you and the future of those in front of you are all sitting on your, your shoulders, and what does it mean for you, the individual who has to make those decisions? So... That to me is what the theme of this play really is and how the war element of it is um, is a vehicle or a vessel to get us into what I think is a really rich psychological journey for someone accepting themselves uh, in leadership. And then uh, the other thing that Shakespeare does with this play, uh, unlike the others you meant, mentioned that he wrote in 1599, is that he gives us chorus and and chorus keeps reminding us that we are in the theater yeah. and to listen carefully to what chorus says is chorus lying about yeah. what's going to happen and it's so uh, foreshadowing of even today yeah. be careful what you listen to because someone will be telling you one thing but in reality is that what's happening and your choice to have um the actor who played the king and the other two, and now we have Larry Bull as chorus. I think was was that a, a subtle message there, or what? Yeah, and and definitely intentional. Um, you know, Larry played Henry, and I sort of started to think about when I did part two because part two is sort of it, it begins with this character rumor, which is you know a false sense of information and fallacy that's being spread throughout the the kingdom. And I was like, and the next play really revolves around somebody else doing that, but they're speaking truth. They're kind of the um, the mouthpiece for the event or the, the brief chronicle of the time, as Shakespeare says um, in Hamlet. And, and I was like, what is that? What is Shakespeare doing here? And then I just started to think about what if that were the same actor that played the father? Because I do think that the play is also about fathers and sons. And... A young man who is trying to step out of the shadow of his father and become who he is in the midst of that so to have this sort of looming presence of the character that was the other character i thought is poetic and and also that he's also cheering henry on which is really what the chorus does in the course of the play he, he kind of rouses us. He says, now all the youth of England are on fire. And it's like, well, they're, they're kind of on fire. They're, they're a little nervous, you know? Uh, and they're like, we, we see the the tavern people in there going off. And he's like, yes, there they go. That's the greatest, you know? And it's all a little bit 
elevated and a little bit heightened and, and positive. So that idea that the chorus was of Henry and Henry's hope for his son to succeed the Lancaster name in going forward was something that I thought could be fused in telling these plays in chronological order. Um, and I love it personally. Uh, I mean, the chorus is a great role. Many actors were like, Can I play this part? And I was like, Well, I, you know, thinking about this thing. And um, just because it's such a great, some great language for one thing, some great speeches. And um, and it's unlike any other role written in Shakespeare, really. I mean, there have there are some sort of chorus like characters, um, like Gower and Pericles and a couple of these others where they kind of lead the lead the story along, but none really called chorus. I'm going to take you, I am going to paint this stuff so that you can and and really also apologize for it. That okay, we're gonna show you this amazing battle in this really confined space. <laughs> and we're only gonna have 20 some odd actors representing thousands of actors go with us on this. <laughs> you know, uh, it's like any Hollywood pitch today. Um, and it's actually some of the stuff that can only happen in the theater. You know, I talked to my cast about that at the beginning. If we had put this scene, like the minute you go out into a gigantic field and you go, we're gonna do a battle, you, or, or we put that on film, on celluloid. It's like, well, you need the horses, and we need the, we need the smoke, we need the blood, we need the mud. We need all that stuff. In the theater, you don't need that. You don't need it. You need a black box, and you need people. And you can go, look it. Here we are. We're in France. It's cold. It's the night before the thing. Go. And that's a beautiful thing that can happen unlike anywhere in the world, and, or in literature or, or art or anything. And Shakespeare was kind of the first person to really capture that, I think, uh, so effectively, certainly. Um, as well as serial drama, really. I mean, that's also what these plays kind of are when you look at that. Henry V is also the ninth play of the ten history plays that he wrote. So he didn't write this as number five, which it's when you look at it in chronological order, it's number five, but it's actually number nine. So he actually learned a lot, <laughs> I think. By the time he wrote this, he actually wrote the Henry VI plays first, and you can tell because <laughs> it's a very young playwright and some of this clunky. And this play really does fuse politics, philosophy, drama, art, life, all into this history play. I think a little bit more um, cohesively than some of maybe some of the other ones. And it's also one of the more positive views of a king. At the end of it, it has a little bit of hope. At the end, which of course gets dashed with the chorus saying he lost France and made his England bleed, so that you understand that it's like Camelot, one brief shining moment, you know, embrace what you have while it's in front of you for the betterment of the future, because you never know what's going to happen. Spoken like King Arthur, which he has played, right. <laughs> and Hamlet. Similar, similar aspects actually, Arthur, the Arthurian legend and, and how, really. I mean, a young prince who's kind of a callow youth and learning in, in, in the midst of it all. He doesn't have somebody else vying for his queen, but, you know. Okay, comments or questions from the audience? Okay, and will you all help me uh, pass the microphone around? We're a little wider here than we were <laughs> over there, and so keep your eyes out. And and uh, I noticed yesterday there was a man who wanted to say something for a long time and couldn't get the attention of the person holding the microphone. So if you have something to to say, uh, raise your hand, and we'll 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 get the microphone to you. But right here, first person over here. Um. So how different is it in the new theater versus the old one? Is it in difference in lighting, difference in staging, just be different feel what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're still learning. We're still learning about how to operate in there. And um, in complete transparency, it, it, everything was late, you know, just because it's a construction project. And so um, we were unable to get access at the time we had hoped to get access and, uh, and that pushback, you know, you saw a little bit last night that we were working through technical issues, <laughs> but that's what previews are for. I hate to say it's, we look at that as a rehearsal because it really is a working rehearsal. 
Um, we're learning about the sun, we're learning about the wind, we're learning about the sound in the space. And, you know, we have, uh, I would say 50 years of institutional knowledge, but it's not that much out there in a completed form. It's like 30 plus. In the atoms, that's 30 years to sort of figure out that space. And here we're in year one, you know. So I can guarantee you if you come back next year, there will be little changes that you will see. I know you will. <laughs> uh, just little subtle things, you know, as much as like putting a little bit more soundboard behind the audience, like it needs to be higher up, little things like that that we can't do right now, uh, but we can do next season to help sort of um, the experience. I will say, and, and those same things we're working through, there's a very long punch list of things like that, but there's also a great deal of excitement and, and the freshness and the newness of it is actually also cause it, it creating a great sense of, um, okay, let's do this, you know, let's experience this. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it's like as an actor out there yet because I haven't acted out there, but um, I get the feeling from a lot of the actors that they really like it because it's a little bit closer and the balcony is a little bit closer and there's a little bit more of a, a would know feeling. But I know we're also dealing with, uh, not dealing with, we're just exploring the level of sound and all of that support that we need. Um, this is my day yesterday and today, just as far as wind. You know, we had a lot of wind last night. I was like, oh my gosh, will it stop the wind? But, and it's also, this always happens actually uh, during this week. And they need the time, and so we'll just kind of have a little Parisian experience. What did you think? What did you think of the evening? You asked Brian what he thought. It was so different. Well, it is going to be different for sure. Different theater, different location. Different, yeah. The feel I'm getting from all of you in the upper echelon. Or, oh, okay, wait. All right, I didn't want that is that it's a, an adventure. You guys are approaching it as, oh, this is a new adventure. Not, oh, it's a job, oh, we have to do it. It's an adventure, and it, it feeds all of us, and it's great. Good, good, good. Thank you. Whoa, look out. Good, yeah, and I mean, I mean, you know, they're going to be, like, the trees around the grove right now. These are going to grow. These are, we're gonna have some. We have some sails that are engineered here to cover for some coverage for this area. This is temporary, but also an event, you know. And uh, we want people here to experience it and be a part of the the growth of it, also. Um, and I will say the support spaces are night and day, really. I mean, the old space. Nobody saw the the challenges of the old space. You didn't see that for the actors, for the designers, for the, the crew. And that space um, is just, it's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable to have two bathrooms for 30 people down there. Little things like that, you know. One or two sinks for an entire Shakespeare cast. The Yeah, I mean, like, but just little things like that, that, um, so each dressing room here has their shower, they have a shower, they have bathrooms, the support services, this is all ADA compliant, you know. Uh, so while there is some charm that is not maybe lost because it's a different type of thing, it's actually more supportive and more conducive for the way we're operating right now. Yeah, the, the entire stage floor is trapped, so we can put traps actually in any new space. There's a, an effects trough where we can pump fog and do any kind of magic and everything. So there's just some more technical advances on top of that. Um, and I also say this with a great deal of admiration and respect for the old, the previous space, you know. Uh, and now it's about building new memories in the new space. That's also <laughs> taking a lot of that cherished thing and infusing that into this to make it bolder, more um, muscular, uh, as well as um, easier for our people. I had a, a couple of questions about the casting. Uh, realizing well, there were several roles of the devil and triple cast and 
and things like that. But I'm asking about the women in, in the cast. Yeah. Realizing that Shakespeare's cast were all men. But how many of the how many females would there actually be in that cast dressed as females in Shakespeare's time? Uh, zero. Yeah. There would be none. Well, there would I mean, be an, it's hot, actually, women were not allowed to appear on the stage. No, I, I realize that, but what I'm asking is how many men would be dressed as females in that cast? I mean, you've got the queen. The queen is actually not. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, they've got the queen, Catherine, and Alice. Those are the three. So three. all the females in there would just, we've got to find roles for the, for the company. That's it, all the other. Yes and no. Um, I was also very interested in having Montjoy as a woman um, and another Rambure also because I thought that the argument in the play is this thing about the Salic law. No woman shall be inheritrix in Salic land. This idea that an offspring cannot come from a free female line that they themselves have broken and do not adhere to, but it's preventing somebody from their own legitimacy somewhere else. So I thought the irony and the sort of hypocrisy of that could actually be a little bit stronger by also having women of power in this court that are just that. And um, and so there's that element of it. I wanted that female presence in the play and not just in the written roles that are written as female characters. Um, and it is our job to rethink these plays differently for a more contemporary setting. And the fact of the matter is, there are not enough women roles for women in Shakespeare. And I'll tell you what, if Shakespeare were writing today, I bet you that would be completely different. Uh, because he was a playwright ahead of his time in the sense that he himself was breaking the mold outside of what other people were doing. And he was also writing for the queen, uh, who he had great respect and great admiration for. And you see that in the work and the way he's sort of dancing around some political issues over the course of some of the canon. Um, I think if those women were allowed to be on the stage, he would have probably written many more women's roles. And the women's roles that he has written are actually some of the most powerful roles in Shakespeare. Lady Macbeth. Beatrice, Rosalind, Viola, Constance. These are very, 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 very strong women. And I thought that, why can't that also coexist with some of these roles that are male roles? Well, they're not termed as male roles. Montjoy is the herald. Now, would they have had a male, a female herald at the time? Probably not. But in our world, they do. And I want them to because I think it creates a new level of understanding. And I also think that there's also another layer in there of relationship that's starting to happen between the characters. Um, and that the females in the French court actually see the irony as well as some of the ridiculousness of the men in that <laughs> camp. Um, because let's face it, the Dauphin is not the most ideal prince. <laughs> and they're cocksure and their attitudes are cocksure. And you hear a voice of reason in the midst of this about describing the English that they don't adhere to. So that was something that was interesting to me. And, um, and I love it. And I also have women playing men, actually, or, or boys also. Yes. And that, I think, is cool also. You know, why is it okay for a, a, a female actress to play a boy, but it's not okay for a female actress to play a man or, or make that woman, that man a woman? You know, that is sort of a thing that was dancing in my head where I was like, well, no, there are no rules here. There are no rules. We create the rules. And... Um, and then that level of storytelling can resonate in a new way. How many of you thought that Montjoy last night was supposed to be a man, but was played by a female actor? And how many of you thought that Montjoy was indeed a female in yeah, a French French woman? How many of you thought got that? And how many of you thought it was Kelly Rogers playing the role of a man? 
Okay. Yeah, and I also think, I mean, like that scene I love because it's like all these guys talking about the Salic law and the, you know, the Archbishop of the Church really not forcing Henry's hand because I do think they're, it's sort of a win win for both of them. You get, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But then comes these two powerful women in the midst of this delivering the message in this whole room of men. It was like, okay, what is that? What's that level of storytelling here that we're saying? Um, and to have it voiced from Montjoy, who is actually speaking for the king, which is something that Kelly and I talked a great deal about, was she's the voice of the other people, and yet also has her own opinion layered in that over the course of her journey about how she's relaying some of that information. And her own point of view, on top of the point of view of someone else, I think is really, really interesting. Um, as you see in politics today, left and right, um, when you see a press secretary get up and try to, let me have, how am I going to describe this? <laughs> this thing that a lot of people don't necessarily agree with, and maybe they don't agree with also, how they're going to paint that for, for the public. Yeah, yeah. On that line, that, and, and I'll get right to you, but I was just thinking of this, that in this political year, we have this play, we'll have Julius Caesar, but I was also thinking about how there have been a few essays written recently that I've read where one of the real pushbacks against this political year is that a female should not be president. It's all right to be a senator, and it's all right to be secretary of state, but don't go for the highest office. And that's the elephant in the room that people aren't talking about. But I've read, I just read an essay yesterday about this, and went, this, this author went through one through ten about the pushback of the current nominee, the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party, and how what it really is about that there is a segment of our society that says, you can be here and you can be here, but you cannot be the leader of our country. And I thought of that when you were just talking about having um, Montjoy and having Kelly as Montjoy listening to what is going on. It's fascinating. Okay, so go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking, because you just sparked me with, you know, maybe it's not so much that a woman can't be president, but that woman can't be president. Anyway, um, when, um, I read the ending part that was going to be the king trying to woo the, the French princess. That sparked a memory in me, and I know I've never seen Henry V before, of uh, the king trying to woo a French princess, and I think it was you over here. <laughs> and but what, when was that? Uh, 2009, actually, we did approximately Henry V, where I did play Henry, so that that could be the case. Yes. Was it a part of it or something? Yeah. This that that scene. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you haven't. Oh, I did see it. Okay. But what I'm saying is, when I halfway through, when I looked at it and I said, I know this, and it was Brian that did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I don't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. So. <laughs> okay. Well, you think a little bit different when you did it, John. The world was a little different. Yeah, I mean, the scene is still the same. I mean, it's written the same. You know, uh, there have been some trims and edits, just mostly for the sake of clarity and, and time. But um, it's actually a really amazing scene in this play because the whole thing is in prose. And those of you that, I mean, that, just technically speaking, when when some when a character speaks verse is quite different from when a character speaks prose, and the key usually is that it's more relaxed and a lot easier and can flow because the, the rhyme is gone and the meter is gone. So it's, and a lot of times it shows a level of um, um, not as formal, formal of a moment, and to see that Shakespeare wrote that actually into this play is I think really beautiful because we get a sense of how coming through. The king, this young kid who is like all of us when it comes to wooing the opposite sex, that we become giddy and un, you know awkward, and he himself becomes humble and and also respectful of the union and what the future of the union means together. That the most important line I think in that entire scene is when he says, "Shall not thou and I compound a boy, half French, half English?" 
that will to Constantinople take the Turk by the beard, shall we not? The, the goal there for Henry is an offspring that is a unified offspring, that the bloodline in the show becomes fused of English and French going forward. That is, to me, his main modus operandi about his own legitimacy of, of, of pushing the kingdom forward and creating a united kingdom, this sense of working together for the future of, of the region. So and that comes from someone who is both a deaf politician and a wooer at the same time, someone who is falling in love with someone who doesn't speak the same language, that's another key theme and thread in the play is the sense of language and words and metaphor and uh, um, rhetoric to sway others. We see that in the Scotch and the Irish and the Welsh and the English in that scene where we see four different nations trying to communicate and not understanding them. We see that in the English camp where they are disgruntled and they're not on the same mindset. We see that in the French camp about one person thinking this. And then we see it quite literally with a woman princess who's learning English to try to talk to him and he trying to speak French. But that there's a sense of understanding between the two of them that is greater than words and greater than language is a theme that Shakespeare is threading in here. Um, and it's woven in a really charming, beautiful scene, I think. That's really a love scene. And it, it also is a bit of a breath of fresh air, I think, in the midst of all this, like, ah, you know, I gotta do this, and this great deep com contemplation also becomes a giddy moment of a young man and a young woman who recognize something in them, but they are both also the future monarchs of their nation, you know? Um, and well, that is very way. human. Were they the same words that you used in 2009? They are. Yeah, the script is the same, if that's your question. Yeah, it's Shakespeare's word. I didn't write it, trust me. Uh, well, that's probably just the nature of it being different people and different director at a different time and all of that. So, yeah. Thank you. Let me just ask you a quick question. Um, you know, I am old and I don't remember, but I don't remember ever seeing that moment of humanity from Henry when like he has to hang Marta when he sees the boy that is dead is is that new to this play or I, it's it's not new uh, well no it's just our take on what this is for me you know those those characters are characters from his past also that he had a more personal relationship with and that is really closing the door on a former sense of self i think and moving forward the death of the boy is quite literally metaphoric for the young man who is now an, an, a man an adult that that he has shed that sense of himself and the boy really is sort of that. You see the boy in Henry IV Part Two as a page to Falstaff that the prince has given to Falstaff to sort of bother him, this sort of young little page who's there. And then the page sort of straddles both worlds, the boy. He's in the tavern and he's also kind of related to Henry. And then he has to go and fight for Henry in this. And I really saw that as a shifting tide also of the boy and the boy speaks about that in this play, about turning away those people. And it becomes an examination of right and wrong, really. And that is a big thread in the Henry Four plays about justice and what justice means and choosing the right path. And it all culminates in this play, where in the former plays, Prince Hal has said, no, you will be hanged for your wrongs. He says to Bardolph, he says to Falstaff, they just choose to think they can live this sort of thing. And that is sad, I think, because he's tried to infuse a different sense of thinking in those characters, and they just can't. They, are, they themselves are unable to change, whereas Hal is able to change. 
and is able to take that and learn and become something different and recognize goodness as well as those things you should not particularly do. The you know the the interesting thing in the play that Bardolph steals a pax, and a pax is um well there's actually a little bit of discrepancy become some uh, there's two versions and and some people misconstrue pax or pix and a pix is actually a piece of is actually the container that contains the communion at a church the the communion wafers or bread is is held in this a pix a pax is a picture of the crucifixion that a congregation would pass amongst its its members to kiss this um pax this thing and it's actually not a huge piece it's not it's not a symbol of monetary value it's more um emotional and 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 um representative um symbolic for the church so the fact that Bardolph steals the Pax is symbolic, that he himself is stealing from God, stealing from right and wrong, and trying to keep that from himself. And then Henry having to make the choice in front of all of his soldiers, the outcome and the fate of someone else for having done this. If he did not hang him or hold them accountable, I don't know what would happen. I don't think he could get those around him to change, to think differently. And that is really hard in this play, I think, because it's kind of the final, not the final one, the boy is the final one, but of those former characters falling away from Henry's past. And we see it in Falstaff dying that's the first thing we see. Then they leave the hostess, and she's there. Nim is introduced in this play. We don't see Nim in the other plays. Nim is actually in Mary Wise of Windsor, oddly, which I think he was kind of writing at a similar time. But we get this thread that Nim was engaged too quickly, and she went with Pistol instead. But Nim, yeah, Bardolph makes a choice and gets hung. Nim runs away, we find out later he is hung. The boy dies in battle. And then we have Pistol, who is left, who at the end of who finds out that Nell has dead through this information that he finds out that quickly herself has died, probably of a broken heart. Um and and the pistol becomes he says, Bod, I'll turn. He makes a choice there to not adhere to this other thing. He's going to hold fast to his own former sense of self, which is a criminal, a thief, and, uh, and a survivor. And that is, I think, metaphoric for what's happening to the kingdom overall also. This, again, is this transition of the old into a new way of thinking. And it comes really boldly infused in the person who is straddling both of those, which is Prince Hal who had a former surrogate father figure, Falstaff, and then his own father about choosing right and wrong. Who do I follow? How does that become who I am now? And his adoption of his own self and his own belief in himself by the end of the play means that those elements of the past disappear and he moves forward in the present. I just got to say, I, I think probably you need to contrast that with the, uh, the, the scene with the, the gloves or, 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 or gauntlet there, where, you know, uh, and he had a choice again to, to make. Uh, to, to really hold tight to, to the rudder or, or show some compassion for his for his soldier there. Uh, when I was uh, watching that, I, maybe maybe there's more than 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 ACI of what he was thinking or where he was going. I'm not even really sure of the 
significance of filling the ground with the drought. Yeah, uh, where, where was it going all with that? What was the end of it? Yeah, um, well, that that's actually a, a good observation, and and you know the scene with Williams and Henry at the campfire, where Henry he, Williams kind of gets to Henry because Williams is speaking the truth, and and the only way he can speak the truth is by having a disguised king, because he would not tell him to his face, well, that's a perilous shot out of an elder gun. You pay him then. The fact that his soldiers believe he will ransom himself to better himself and all of those guys will just die for the cause that's really not going to get them anything is really the, um, the crux of Henry's debate. How he infuses belief in his soldiers to think that he will be that. He will himself say, I will not be ransomed. I am here on the fighting lines with you. You don't really see that in a whole lot of history plays either. The king out there in front of everybody, leading the charge, fighting with everyone. You see it a little bit with Talbot and some of the Henry Sixes, but usually the king is he is out there leading the charge, the warrior king. But what happens is Henry, I think, tries to make an example of Williams by saying, it was me that was this. What do you think about that? And Williams says, you came to me not as yourself. You came to me disguised. You came to me pretending to be something else. And then I think Henry hears that because it's both Henry understanding that he himself was not true to who he was by revealing himself to Williams and saying, let's talk this out. But it got the better of him. And Henry giving him the crowns is actually, I think, respect for the soldier having an authentic sense of self also. That the soldier himself can say to the king, don't, don't throw me out in front of everybody. Don't punish me for you pretending to be something that you're not. And I think Henry hears that and goes, you know what? Give him the crowns. And then Flewellyn turns it and goes, yes, I understand. Flewellyn, who is the great philosopher about the ideal form of battle and using the Romans as an example and all of that about warfare, is like, yes, you're right, and tries to give him a coin. is comic, but it's also that they're honoring the soldier who is one of them and also held fast to what he believed in and that the king also respected that. Um, I, I think it's actually a significant moment for Henry, again, because he not he's not he's humble by that. He he is humble by that. That pulls him back to reality. That it's also not like you win the battle and everything is peachy keen. There are other little things that you have to you know, it's a it's a moment to moment thing where you have to be responsible for your own actions, essentially, and the outcome of that. And hearing it from a common man, a soldier, I think, um, I think it's lovely that he gives him the crowns. And I think it's also not only for Williams, but for those around him also, which is another thing in the play about the public and private of, of, of being a king. Does that make sense? Great answer. Thank you. I'll get around over some. So I was fascinated by uh, your comment on uh, filling some of the roles with women and maybe questioning that aspect of it. And uh, last year we came here and saw Taming of the Shrew with my daughter, who thought that was a terrible play because of the role of the of women. But at the same time, I mean, how do you how do you correlate the two? Is there anything to learn from from putting on a production like Taming of the Shrew, and then at the same time, when you have a play like this, where you can switch up the roles, so to speak? And what I, I don't even know sure exactly how to word my question, but can yeah. you see where I'm going? Uh, I think so. Totally two different plays, for one thing, and that play I think is really what that is kind of well, what that debate is in that play. 
the sort of battle of the sexes and you know the where Kate gets to by the end of the play and where Petruchio gets who's taming who essentially of what that play is can vary from production to production uh, and the sort of misogynistic viewpoint about about some of the elements in that play which are very challenging now and still are challenging. I just read an article about, there's an all female production of it in New York and um, it's just a tricky play. It is a, Shrew is a very hard play in a contemporary society. And um, this play I don't think is about that, same thematically. Um, in fact, there, I, there was really no relation to me at all as far as, far as the female point of view in this play versus that play. Uh, it's just a completely different set of circumstances, really, and stakes. What I did feel with the play was the debate in the play about the Salic law and what that would be like to have a female presence in, the, in there, and also doing these plays that are usually male-based, male-heavy, about getting some females in there. Uh, because it's 2016. <laughs> You know, and nothing says in the text that that is a 